Hey folks, Farmer Noah here. I wanted to make a video today just going over the design that went into our agroforestry systems around the farm and talk a little bit about some of the cheap and mostly free uh, online tools that we used to lay out the design and get really accurate measurements and quantities and really everything we needed to know exactly what to do to install all of the agroforestry systems around the farm. Map of our property here at Wild East Farm with the parcel outlined in the thick white and three foot contour lines overlaid that we purchased from Verge Permaculture. They have a really awesome online mapping tool where you can purchase different packages with hillshade and aspect, slope, contours at whatever interval you desire, and a lot of different features that are really useful for designs on both big and small landscape projects. I'll leave a link in the description below on that. And we selected three foot contours for this property, knowing that the pastures were relatively flat. So we wanted contours with closer intervals than what was provided for free through different government websites but not so close that the sloped portions of the property were hard to read. And we see this, this process of getting contour lines and re reading a contour map and knowing how to interpret a map like this is really a key first step in any design project. We were interested in the idea on whichever farm property we landed on in laying out the silva pasture systems on a key line design which without getting too much into it here i can leave some resources in the description of this video on what that means essentially what the contours in this map told us was that the pastures were so flat relatively speaking that we would actually have the most to gain from going in a north-south pattern above anything else just for maximum solar gain on the plantings and we elected to go that route while putting the tree lanes in a pattern that although is generally north-south is somewhat arbitrarily curved and it's it's a bit on contour but more importantly for us was while maintaining that general north-south orientation allowing more trees in the total square footage of the pastures by curving the lines, as well as valuing the aesthetic component of working in spaces that aren't all straight rows all the time. And we've, we've been happy with that decision as the pastures, as we think, have turned out looking really nice since we installed this design. Now, Google Earth is a totally free program that I really love to use because you can get just about everything you need to know for big scale landscape design projects in terms of quantities of items you need to purchase and space that you're working with as the draw tools to draw the, the tree lanes in this case and the measure tools are one and the same. So with each tree lane I can click on it and get the info and let me drag this in there and I can see that at least roughly based on the aerial footage I'm dealing with around 362 feet of lane and the same is true with each of these tree lanes now we ground truth this meaning we went out and flagged and measured this but the map gave us enough of an idea to be able to multiply out the distance of all the lanes by the spacing between each tree to know exactly how many trees we needed to purchase before ever even landing on the property fully. So it's an extremely useful tool for something like that where with just within just you know less than an hour of work and measuring this out I knew approximately with with very small margin of error how many trees were going to be planted in Northfield based on our spacing. So that's just a little bit on the Google 
earth side of the design and why I value it as a design tool and has been very effective for us. So after going through the process on Google Map of measuring things out and getting an idea of quantities, we got a bit more de detailed with our design, doing a similar process for estimating quantities in our, in our nut orchard, as well as our Yupik blueberry planting. And we're pairing all of this with, you know, long-term on the ground observation and adaptation to this general design. So this is something that we developed over the fall of 2022 to be a guiding framework to move forward, but like in my opinion with any design is flexible and fluid. So just to walk through the whole farm, this is the area that I was detailing in Google Earth we call Northfield. And historically you can see that it was subdivided with different paddocks for the previous owners, cows and horses. And you can see in this map that historically was routinely bush hogged as a primary way of managing the grass. And we're moving away from that and introducing ruminants onto the landscape later this year to graze between the tree lanes. And you can see based on this picture versus the plan that we've now designed and are working with a very stark change in the land use pattern. So here we took the design and, and on this page, you can see the different considerations for designing a farm like this. So for example, having standardized distances between the lanes to accommodate standard width infrastructure. So we can use the same exact fencing or field pens or whatever it may be across the entire farm because it's all standard. Factoring in space for headways to navigate machinery around the field so that I'm not worried about product production spaces coming all the way up to the edge. That's just general good practice in any farming system that you're designing for. And then just different considerations such as utilizing our key line plow, like I said, not on the key line pattern because it's so flat, but rather perpendicular to the historical bush hogging pattern that was used on the landscape with the thought in mind that we would be able to decompact what would be years if not decades of tire tracks from bush hogging in an east-west pattern. So going a little bit further, this is a helpful graphic that we put together just to visualize what the pattern would look like and the different spacings. So in Northfield, we planted a mix of apples, Asian pears, pawpaws, Asian persimmons, and mulberries. With the, can with the fruit trees at 25 feet spacing and hazel shrubs in between at 12 and a half foot spacing. We also see in this note here that each lane includes one native canopy tree of one of the following species. At somewhat random location, thinking that after the lifetime of these fruit trees has expired in the 30 to 50 year range, that these long lived native canopy trees would then take over and be the dominant species after we've passed on so that once the fruit trees are past production, there's still a complex native, there's a complex framework of native trees along the pasture or amongst the pasture. Nut field we designed for over in this section of the farm. It's somewhat more marginal soils in here as opposed to North field, which has the nicest soils on the property. This is fairly poorly draining and fairly clayey and was managed less intensively with the cattle. So it has a higher percentage of forbs, is generally lower quality pasture. And these trees are higher quality, or the, not higher quality, but rather a bit more hardy than some of the high production or than some of the high value fruit trees we planted in Northfield. So trees like walnuts 
in particular and other species in that genus can handle a variety of soil conditions, many of which enjoy or prefer having wetter soil conditions and purchasing nut tree stock in bulk is a bit cheaper in our context. So we could purchase enough trees to plant at spacings where we're factoring in for loss naturally as well as selective culling over time. This is more of an experiment rather than something that we're putting in on the ground strictly for commercial production. Our hopes is that it'll provide staple homestead nut crops for us and our friends and family before those come into production, offering fodder and shade for animals that are rotating through, habitat for birds and insects, and decades-long food security that hopefully will outlive us. And similar pattern here with a mix of pecans, butternuts, English walnuts, black walnuts, and shagbark hickories. So we're curious and excited to see how this evolves over time and what the randomized matrix will eventually look like once some of the trees pass on their own and some are selectively culled out by us so that we can choose for the most vigorous, fast-growing, and healthiest trees. I'll just kind of flip through these next bit slides to just kind of go over the basic idea. If you're curious about any of these, you can pause the video and just read through some of our thinking for each section. But this was used mostly just as a visual guide to explain our design on the farm as well as a reference for ourselves. We planted out hybrid willows as a privacy row. They're extremely rapidly growing and this nursery sprays conventionally and so in addition to being a visual barrier, these will provide protection from overspray or drift on the trees being sprayed in that nursery. As described in the other video where I was on the ground talking about the plantings, we went through of the and, and planted native species along the denuded edges of the riparian as well as the man-made drainage ditches on the property introducing some pretty interesting native species that are native to our region but perhaps not as commonly found in our valley in particular. We planted chestnuts up here on this ridge which weren't highlighted in the video of me on the ground but chestnuts tend to really like growing on dry ridges with lower fertility soil. You don't typically see them naturally growing in floodplain environments, well-drained soil, rocky soil. They prefer these types of conditions. And it's been really interesting to see that already this planting has done very well, despite having very dry conditions in this pretty exposed site. But not only that, but that a bunch of American persimmons are coming up on their own amongst the chestnut plantings, as well as oak saplings, tulip poplar saplings, and a variety of other natives. So we're excited to watch the two sides of the woods here kind of fill this gap over time and become a pretty low effort way to guide succession into this interesting direction where we have a mix of natives as well as the chestnuts all spaced out in a way where we can graze up here on this previously almost bare soil patch of land. So amongst the silvopasture plantings, there's somewhat of a temporal succession in our yield. And when we expect yields to be coming in with the blueberries being the shortest term, hopefully in the three year timeline, we can start picking these and having the farm open up to you pick enterprise that will eventually complexify over time to include some of the other fruit trees and perhaps get into you pick flowers and other ways of bringing people to the farm and getting them excited about, you know, being somewhat responsible for their own 
harvest of, of their food and providing a space where that's not only possible but enjoyable. So we planted this slope, this west-facing slope, with blueberries, with a variety of different varieties that do well in the southern climates that all yield at different times. Part of our thinking here was this hill is too steep for machine use or any kind of regular or any kind of production that would require any kind of routine use of machinery or even mobile animal infrastructure. So taking it out of that type of production and allowing for it to be managed by hand tools and traversed just by foot over time it was part of our thinking for putting the blueberries on this slope. And then this is just a bit about some of our considerations for the tree and shrub protection and fertility inputs. I won't go into too much detail verbally here, but you can see that we have pretty extensive inputs when planting these trees. We really think that when planting a tree, you want to do everything you can to give them as good of conditions as possible. And inevitably, there's going to be some loss and some trees that don't do as well. But we never want to look back and think that that was because our planting holes weren't adequate or because we didn't offer enough of a kickstart nutritionally for the trees to get really established. So, yeah, that's just a bit about what went into the design process. So I hope that was an informative and interesting video, just going through some of the back end side of what went into designing and ultimately installing this 12 acres of silva pasture on the farm in our first year here. I'm really curious about other folks who have done similar projects on similar or different scales. And just to hear from any other folks in the design world, any thoughts that they have and any questions that anyone else might have, please remember to subscribe to the channel, leave a comment and like the video if you liked the video. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.